I don't really like to play favorites with the people I interview, but I have to say this book is really quite beautiful. Uh, some of you have probably read it. The, the writing is lyrical all the way through, and it's, uh, uh, it's a book about trees that has some of the best characters I've ever read. It's, it's sort of amazing. I'm going to start by asking you to read a little bit of it so we get a flavor of the book, and then I'll ask some questions, and then we'll come back to the audience after a little while. Very we'll good. kick it off, Richard. I thought I would just read the opening page and a half, uh, partly because it is a self-contained set piece, it's just a lyrical prelude to the book as a whole, and partly because I thought if you can't read from page one without establishing something, you've got a problem. So, <laughs> First, there was nothing. Then there was everything. Then, in a park above a western city after dusk, the air is raining messages. A woman sits on the ground, leaning against a pine. Its bark presses hard against her back, as hard as life. Its needles scent the air and a force hums in the heart of the wood. Her ears tuned down to the lowest frequencies. The tree is saying things in words before words. It says, sun and water are questions endlessly worth answering. It says, a good answer must be reinvented many times from scratch. It says, Every piece of earth needs a new way to grip it. There are more ways to branch than any cedar pencil will ever find. A thing can travel everywhere just by holding still. The woman does exactly that. Signals rain down around her like seeds. Talk runs far afield tonight. The bends in the alders speak of long ago disasters. Spikes of pale chinkapin flowers shake down their pollen. Soon they will turn into spiny fruits. Poplars repeat the wind's gossip. Persimmons and walnuts set out their bribes and rowans their blood red clusters. Ancient oaks wave prophecies of future weather. The several hundred kinds of hawthorn laugh at the single name they're forced to share. Laurels insist that even death is nothing to lose sleep over. Something in the air's scent commands the woman. Close your eyes and think of willow. The weeping you see will be wrong. Picture an acacia thorn Nothing in your thought will be sharp enough. What hovers right above you? What floats over your head right now? Now. Trees even farther away join in. All the ways you imagine us, bewitched mangroves up on stilts, a nutmeg's inverted spade, gnarled Baja elephant trunks, the straight-up missile of a song are always amputations. Your kind never sees us whole. You miss the half of it and more. There's always as much below ground as above. That's the trouble with people, their root problem. Life runs alongside them, unseen, right here right next, creating the soil, cycling water, trading in nutrients, making weather, building atmosphere, feeding and curing and sheltering more kinds of creatures than people know how to count. A chorus of living wood sings to the woman, if your mind were only a slightly greener thing, we'd drown you in meaning. The pine she leans against says, 
Listen. There's something you need to hear. Thank you. So I, I, I get a sense that, um, that at some point you um, suddenly started seeing into things that you had been maybe overlooking your whole life, the way a lot of the characters in the book have, that, you know, you were, that there's this sort of world that, that all of us move through without really noticing uh, uh, that it's a world dominated by, by trees and by nature and, and, and plants and so on. Uh, how did that happen? And I, I get a sense it may have happened while you were living in California, right? I think you were at Stanford maybe five, six years ago. That's right. That was the beginning of the awakening. That's right. Uh, I've lived in a lot of places in the world, but mostly in cities. Um, large and, and mid-sized. Uh, I, I retired from a job that I've been working in, in the Midwest and accepted a job at Stanford and went out there uh, in, in 2012. And, you know, for those of you who know the Central Peninsula and, and, and Palo Alto and, and that area, it's a, it's a strange part of the world. It's, a, it's an intense part of the world. Uh, on the one side, you know, you have Silicon Valley, which incidentally used to be called the Valley of Heart's Delight. It was nothing but fruit trees, as far as the eye could see. Um, yeah, Blossom Valley, another name for it. Um, but now, it's the engine of the present and of the future. It's, it's Google, Apple, Intel, HP, Facebook, you know, every HQ that's created the present and is creating the future. Right. Um, and it's an extremely go-go culture. You know, uh, there are a lot of people there who are pretty sure that if they just hold on for a while longer, they're going to live forever. You know, and that <laughs> all, technology will solve all the problems that, that there are. When I needed to escape the valley, just on the other side was the Santa Cruz Mountains. And through foresight of a lot of people, Wallace Stegner among them, actually, mm -hmm. um, you founded the literary program. That's right. right. The, and the great, the great, great yeah. writer, uh, Wallace Stegner. Um, there, there is a tremendous amount of land that's been set aside as open space preserve. I think you can walk pretty much from San Francisco to, to, to Santa Cruz, you know, in, in this public set aside land. And it's mostly, we're, we're right, right above Palo Alto, it was mostly uh, second growth redwood. And, you know, if you've been in a redwood forest, I, 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 can't, I can't really claim that I had any special sensitivity to trees before this time, but you don't need to have special sensitivity of trees to, to, for trees to, to, to resonate with a redwood forest. I mean, there's just, it's like being in a holy spot, you know, it's just right. like being inside one of the great cathedrals. I was walking up there one day, actually this is where I also just got addicted to walking as a, as a way of being, as a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are hundreds of miles of trails up there and I, I want to walk them all. But it was, I, I was up there one day and came across an uncut tree, an uncut redwood, an old one. And I had been marveling for all this time at, at these enormous, you know, majestic trees in these dense, wonderful forests. A redwood can do a lot in a hundred years. It's, it's really a fast-growing, incredible tree. But when you let it go a thousand years, it's something from another world. And, uh, you know, I was standing in front of this tree. It was as wide as a house. It was as tall as a football field is long. And you know, maybe almost as old as, as Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, this is what this forest looked like before we got to it. And it was, it was mind-boggling to me. And I, I started to read up on the region, and, and you know, what, what I realized was that this forest had been cut down to build San Francisco and to rebuild San Francisco. And one thing leads to another in human culture, and you can say without exaggeration that Silicon Valley was down there because the redwoods were up here. And the, there, this was a, a, 
a, a, a strange, you know, visceral apprehension of a kind of reciprocal relationship between human history and tree mm. history, you know, operating, unfolding on very different time frames, um, that I had never seen really treated in, in fiction before. And, you know, I realized that there was a large part of our story that actually hadn't come on stage for a while. Right. And that's what I wanted to do. So, so you had this really powerful connection with with the redwoods and with, with the, the contrast, right, between this sort of teeming sort of, you know, the, the tech money, the tech corporations and so on on one side, uh, which probably was not, probably, probably not the, um, uh, probably not exactly all of the best human qualities, right, in one place, well, right? On, on, the, on the, maybe the, on the one hand, no, but on the other hand, it absolutely epitomizes our incredible ingenuity and our ability right. to, uh, to take control of time and space and to t turn them into other things. Right, so you, so you weren't fleeing a sort of, um, you weren't fleeing Palo Alto because of, a sort of narrow-mindedness or self-absorption or anything like that. You weren't you weren't doing a, a sort of back to the land, sort of no, e was, exile kind of thing. It was more it was more about thinking about time differently mm -hmm. and thinking about reciprocal relations differently and thinking about the debt that we humans owe to non-humans. Right. And right. you know, once I started, you know, looking into that story. The whole human story changed for me. Right. So you had this this big sort of philosophical, uh, emotional response to, to 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 being in these redwoods. But then at the end of the day, you're a novelist, right? So, yeah. so if you're so if you're going to do something with this, um, you've got to you've got to take it somewhere. And the the tree the the wondrous thing about the tree is that it hasn't changed in any obvious way, except it's changed maybe in subtle ways, uh, you've got to somehow make this a novel that has drama, that has character, that has a uh, story, yeah. and so on. Yeah. And that's something that people have not done that well uh, or that widely in literary fiction, right? I mean, we have, there are nature writers, but many of them are poets. Uh, they're... Um, uh, conservationists like John Muir, they're sort of, what would you call Thoreau? They're sort of cranky memoirists like Thoreau, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, and we can say that, or, or, that nature is in the background a lot of, right. uh, you know, a lot of, you know, but as far as a, a novel that puts trees and, and, and nature and the earth at the center, hasn't been done that often. So does, does that prove to be, that proved to be a difficult task for you as a novelist? I, I, I would modify what you said just a little bit. I would say it hasn't been done very often recently. Uh-huh, okay. Right? That this used to, be, work, it uh, used to be at the center right, of the stories right. that we told ourselves. And, you know, if, if you look at American fiction as recently as the 19th century. Hawthorne or something. Yeah, and it, 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 the, all of these stories are about this precarious relationship between us right. and not us, right. yeah, but here's what I think has happened, you know, in a nutshell. As, as we have gotten better and better at dictating the terms of, of time and space and taking control and mastery over the world, our stories have collapse back into ourselves. You know, our, our, I think of it this way. In, when I was in grade school, I can remember a, an English teacher saying there are, there are three kinds of dramas that, that compel us. And one is the drama of a conflicted person, right? The fact that we are constantly, each of us, trying to accommodate the contradictions and, and uh, battles inside our own psyche. Right. And you can call that a psychological story. Right. Um, there is a second order of drama where you have values and I have values and they're, they're not commensurable and right. somehow we're both decent people and values are laudable, but the way we would solve a particular problem is not the same, so we have to negotiate that and, you know, the, the, those kinds of social or, or mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. tensions, right? Um, 
either individuals or groups of people. Right. But this third kind of story, which is we humans as a whole trying to accommodate or come to terms with the fact that the rest of the world does have agency, does have desire, does have purpose and, and meaning, but it's not ours. Right, is, so is that what in elementary school they call man versus nature? Yeah. The way they introduce so, the Jack London novel. Man, that man versus himself, man versus right. man, and man versus nature. Right, 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 right. sure. And, the, and because we had this sense, somehow, you know, it, we passed a threshold in our, in our cultural history, and we thought, well, that battle's done. You know, we've won that one, right? <laughs> There's no more. Yeah, you mentioned Jack London. It's sort of an archaic idea that somehow we might right. still be right. threatened with this. Well, see, now my feeling is now that we're realizing that not only didn't we win, but we're going to actually have trouble just hanging on, that that whole type of drama is going to come back into our stories with a vengeance. It's going to become an increasingly important part of the literature that, that we make for ourselves. Right, right. Well, part of what's fascinating about the book is that it, it's very much about, I mean, I was going to say it's about the relationship of man and nature, but it's really, in a lot of ways, about people who are stepping back and watching or watching nature do what it does or listening to it deeply and discovering new things about it. Uh, and yet the book is told from the point of view of, of characters. And, and, uh, maybe you could tell us, uh, and they're wonderful and very vivid characters, maybe tell us about two, three of the characters here, that there are a lot of them, but give us just a glimpse of the kind of people that we encounter. Well, you know, I, I, I should say that when I started out with this book, my dream, you know, that, 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 you know, that revelation as it, as, that I had up in Santa Cruz Mountains as it unfolded was that our, our problem is that we think of ourselves as qualitatively separate from everything that else right. that there is. It's right. this notion of human exceptionalism. And how, how would you tell a story that troubles that? And I thought, well, one way would be to make the trees themselves central characters. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really wanted right. to do. Right, something out of Tolkien or yeah, something, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah the Ents. Right. I, I wanted somehow to, to have these trees with their personalities and their agency and the, their volition at the, at the heart of the story. Well, there were some technical challenges associated <laughs> yeah. with that. The dialogue gets a little slow when you do that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and that's part of it too, right? That, that whatever drama is unfolding in a tree or among trees, right. and it turns out, and I hope we can get into this, yeah. they turn out to be vastly social creatures. And, yeah. and the, yeah. the, more, the more that's discovered about them, this is all unfolding in the last few decades, the more we realize how interdependent trees are on each other. But more on that later. The, the, clearly, I had to find some way of solving this problem and it, using human proxies to get these other supporting characters on stage in a major way. Um, we, we really love ourselves. You know, we, <laughs> we really like things that, that look like us and operate on our time frame and are about our size and move around at our speed. Those are the things that we understand. You know, we're, we're shaped by natural selection to pay I incredible mm -hmm. attention. In fact, I mean, we can, we can see a face at the age of five and, and, right. and remember that face, you know, at the age of 50. It's really stunning. Right. Where, whereas, and, you know, you can, mo most people can barely tell a sycamore from a maple, you know? Right, right. Um, so, so the, the question was how to make the story compelling to us, and, and, and the answer was to, and to put us center stage, but, but to tell the story of these multiple people who, for very different reasons, as you mentioned, start to have these moments of realization of just how much of themselves depends upon the non-human. And, and, right. uh, so you, you have, on the one hand, you have um, uh, the character Patricia Westerford, who's a, a, a hard-of-hearing little girl uh, whose father is an ag extension agent, and she doesn't really understand people. She can't interact with them in the way that they, you know, that they demand, and she's a bit cut off partly because of her disability, right. and, and partly because her father opens her up onto this magnificent world of living things. So she, she begins life identifying with plants, and that... And that uh, uh, sets a trajectory for her for later years, and in fact, she's so 
capable and has such empathy for these non-human things that when she gets into graduate school in forestry and starts doing her research, she is in a position to put forward this rather stunning idea at the time that plants are communicating with each other over the air. That a tree that's being attacked by insects will not only start to produce its own insecticide, but issue pheromones that alert nearby trees to this invasion, and the nearby trees start to set up a preemptive defense. So it's almost like trees sharing an immune system. Because of her ability to identify with trees, she's in a position to do that research, which is immediately mocked and ridiculed in her field, and she becomes a pariah. She's driven out of the field, spends many years uh, underground. So that's, that's one extreme, somebody who starts out with extreme sensitivity. On the other, uh, uh, would be, you know, uh, just to, to pick another one of the nine at random, Olivia Vandergraaf, who is uh, uh, a, an extreme example of the narcissistic, self-indulgent, uh, young, 20-year-old undergraduate uh, uh, who's studying actuarial science, partly because she doesn't know what it is, you know. <laughs> and, um, it, it, a hard, hard-living, drug-using, a college girl who has a near-death experience and comes out of it on the other end you know, completely alienated from the person that she was right. and hearing these voices. So, you know, between these two, one that, you know, starts the story with absolutely no ability to empathize with anything except herself and right. the other one who extends personhood even into green things. I, I deploy these other characters, uh, each of whom you know, comes to trees in a different way, you know, becomes unblinded, begins to see their agency. Little by little, I guess about half of the characters mm -hmm. are drawn up together and, and the stories begin to unite um, in, in this effort in the, in the 90s that people refer to as the Timber Wars, the attempt to save the last small patches of American old growth forest. It's kind of stunning, I should, you know, just as an aside, it really, it bowled me over to, to, to realize, you know, while doing this research, that of these four great forests that, that uh, um, populated the American continent when Europeans first came, each of which was considered to be inexhaustible in its day, right. about 95 to 98% of them are gone okay. and, and have been re replaced either by agriculture, plantations of some kind, tree farms, or, or uh, monocrop uh, tree plantations, or second growth forest, but of the, of the old original patches, almost not, none remains. In fact, I saw a, a stunning stat the other day that um, more, um, about 55% of American trees were younger than 40 years old. Mm. Yeah. So mm. it just gives you a sense of how completely man-altered yeah. the yeah. continent is. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the, so the, the trees that, that inspired you and that are, you know, inspiring, the characters in here are hundreds, in some cases thousand, you know, 2,000 years old. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've had foliage on the planet for a very long time. Um, but I wonder if there's something a little more specific happening in the last few years, maybe in the last decade of and I don't know if it's happening in literary fiction, but a kind of, uh, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's a renaissance in nature writing that I'm talking about, maybe it's um, the kind of general public New Yorker reading person just kind of getting more, so, so here's what I'm thinking of, things like, was it Elizabeth Colbert's book, The Sixth yes, Extinction, for instance? Yep which everybody I know read, um, you have simultaneously the research that you're talking about here about how uh, trees are in fact a communal kind of creature, right? And, and there was another book that everybody read that came out last year, the Page of Old Laban book, The Hidden, the Hidden Life of Trees, I think, okay, which was right. extremely yeah, there you successful. Go. And, 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 and he, he managed to synthesize and popularize a lot of the research. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. And, and then in, in, in Britain, I don't know if there's an equivalent here, but in Britain you have this writer, Robert McFarlane, yeah, you know who I'm talking fantastic about? Fantastic writer, I've read Who I was appalled to see is younger than me. I thought he was <laughs> like a 90-year-old man who'd hiked across the continent 40 times. He but, does have a very old... Yeah, he voice. does, yeah. yeah. 
but just an incredible sort of lyrical writer. And uh, uh, I guess the, his book, The Old Ways, was the first one I read. Yeah. Um, and there's a bunch of people like that um, in Britain. Uh, if you're in a bookstore in London, they'll have a huge shelf of nature writing, and it's a lot of it's new. You know. So anyway, it, it feels, I'm just guessing, but it feels to me like there's a consciousness uh, and a, uh, it's, it's not just a back to the land thing. I don't know what it is exactly, but I just wonder if you feel like you're part of a larger dialogue or larger sensitivity, a larger kind of waking up to the fact that there are other people on the, uh, or other things on the planet with us. I do. I, 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 do, I do think there's a groundswell asking this question of how are we going to remain here and how can we meet the neighbors and how can we right. live with them. Um, however, you know, to, to be slightly more pessimistic, <laughs> I, I think there's a, a, a proliferation of everything. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, sure. there, are, there are now seven and a third billion of us, and we're producing right. cultural artifacts at faster and faster rates and consuming them at faster and faster rates. Right. So you probably could make a case for the, the, uh, an upsurge in just about any yeah, kind Yeah, any of trend thinking. we want to identify, yeah. we could probably figure out a way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I hear you. But, but I do think that that's, that's the one that's going to decide, you know, yeah. our, our, our durability here. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's interesting that the, the book sets itself as a story of, you know, saving the trees. Um, but there is a kind of uh, inversion by the end of the book uh, where it becomes clear that really this is a story about saving us. Hmm. Uh, the trees, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing, but that idea of, of getting something up on a woody trunk and, and extending branches and putting out your solar cells and, and turning the sunlight into food, you know, into everything that there is, that's such a great idea that actually natural selection comes up with it at least six different times, hmm. independently. Mm -hmm. and, and trees have been around for, you know, for hundreds of millions of years, you know, th 300 million years or right. more. Way before the dinosaurs. They've, they've, they've lived been, through yeah. mass extinctions. Right, right. Um, you know, a couple of, of Colbert's mass, mass extinctions. Right. You know, the, the question is, what about this 100,000-year-old upstart, you know, the master mm -hmm. of the universe, and, and how, how is that story going to be stabilized and extended? Right, right, yeah, we're the, uh, we're the newcomers, effectively. Um, let me ask you about something slightly different. You've been personally and intellectually interested in music for a very long time. You've got some books that are more explicitly uh, driven by your interests, especially in jazz, Bach, and classical music. Uh, I wonder if, if music, its structures, the way it, what it does to your mind, you know, if, if it has any bearing in, in, in this book, which seems in some ways to be something fairly different. Yeah, less in, less in this book than in a number of the other books. Mm -hmm. This book structurally, I mean, I think you alluded to it earlier, yeah. um, it, it takes the shape of a giant tree, so you get these, right. these backstories, these, these nine characters. It's almost like reading a series of, of short stories with great compression and great... Yeah, the, for those of you who have the book, you've already seen it, but it's, it's all nine, I guess, characters have these... Each one gets sort of a novella or something from the beginning, so that's part of the reason I wondered if this might be the way, you know, uh, the Goldberg variations or something, yeah, you know, like a, like a Bach fugue or something right. like that. Yeah. Because so you, introduce, you introduce all of the themes or right. motives and then you combine them with variations. That just kind of feels like you're doing right. something like that here. Yes, but rather than, you know, the, 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 the explicit analogy structurally for this book is that th those are the roots of this massive tree and as right. these stories right. uh, um, uh, converge. It, the, the, the second section of the book is called Trunk, and that becomes right. that, that that becomes the dramatic account of these uh, characters who move forward with their environmental activism. Then there's a a kind of crisis point uh, where a catastrophe backfires and shoots them out all in their separate ways. And that part of the book, the third section, is called Crown, as they as right. they split outwards into their separate lives. And the final part of the book, uh, which deals with the, the long-term and unforeseen consequences of their actions, called Seeds, where the, the story right. re-germinates. Right. For music, it wasn't 
honestly, it wasn't a huge in, uh, inspiration on this book. It has been, right. as you say, a right. number of other times. This is my 12th novel. I would say four of my books are explicitly mm -hmm. on musical themes structured as musical pieces or mm -hmm. dealing with makers of music or uh, music as a cultural phenomenon. Right, yeah. right, right. Do you still spend a lot of time listening to music, playing music? Do you feel like it keeps your brain alive or keeps you thinking in ways that you need oh, to think as a writer? Yeah, beyond a doubt. And, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, music was a constant source of refreshment for me while I wrote the book, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. But I, I'll say that there's another way in which, you know, the, the, my compositional technique for this book changed profoundly. So I, I've been working on the book for over five years. Um, and I had been reading for, for a couple of years about, about uh, the paucity of old growth and how different old growth is from, from forests that, that we know when we think of an American forest. And while I was reading, I kept reading about very specific patches of old growth, and I went around the country visiting them. And one was uh, the... Smoky Mountains. I kept reading that mm -hmm. if you wanted to see what an eastern broadleaf forest looked like before the crazies came, um, <laughs> that the Smokies was a good place to go. Mm -hmm. And I went down there three years ago, and you know I've I've walked in a lot of forests, and the, they're they're you know even the the regrowth in the Smokies is extremely impressive and beautiful and restorative. But as I walked up into these patches, there's about 100,000 acres still left in the Smokies mm. of what, what a forest looked like before it was cut or what an Right, so how, how old are those, the oldest trees there? Well, it depends on the species. But, right. You know, a, a good eastern tulip poplar can be well over 500 years. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the other, you know, an old hemlock or an old, you know, uh, uh, silver bell. I've seen maples there that were several hundred years old too. Right. Uh, and the nothing, chest, nothing like the western them. trees. You know, nothing like a, a bristlecone pine. Seven thousand years. Seven thousand wow. years. That's sure. longer than we've had writing. Right. Right. An individual tree. Right. But in any case, so I go up into these, you know, into the old growth in the Smokies, and it's like, you know, my jaw was just, you know, the farther up into the forest I got, the lower my jaw was. Mm -hmm. There's something about standing there and looking at this and saying, this is what my country looked like. You know, th this is not only what it looked like you know, prior to, to the Europeans, but what it looked like up, you know, at, the, at the end of the last ice age, mm, you know, right. 10,000 years ago. Right. And, and I liked what it looked like. You know, I thought that was, you know, there was some feeling there. You, could, you hear a difference. You, know, you smell a difference and you see a difference. And I, it got under my skin, and I, and I couldn't forget it. And I ended up buying a house there and, and moving right. down there. And I've been living there for the last two and a half years. So the book literally changed my life, literally redirected me. You know. so, so in reading this, there's so much passion. You know, you've got these really uh, detailed descriptions of, of what's happening when people go outside into yeah. forests or when they yeah. are driving and they suddenly see the trees for the first time? Or, I did an interview or, this morning with uh, Pat Morrison at the, oh, at the uh -huh. Times, and right. she, she called it tree porn. Right, right, exactly, <laughs> right. right. It's like there's so much detail, and it's so vivid, it almost is sort of sexual. Right. And I guess when we're talking about reproduction, you know, it's, uh, well, anyway, I won't go there. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I do imagine you, so your characters are connecting deeply with uh, with especially these huge old trees, yeah. and I wonder if, besides moving there, it's made you uh, spend the free time uh, you have hiking, walking, uh, connecting, communing with with these creatures. Oh, it's, it's changed. It's changed everything about my day, hmm. and and my and my season and my year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, music remains a, a wellspring of inspiration, but but. Walking is now. I mean, I used to feel in. Uh, I've been I've been writing novels for a third of a century now. You know, this is right. number twelve, and and I, I I used to feel like if I didn't get my thousand words mm. every day, mm -hmm. then I wasn't a real writer. You know, and it was right. all going to disappear, and I wouldn't right. get it back somehow. Right. And there was a tremendous work ethic in it. 
right. and driven by fear, which is, I think, the I way... I think that what drives most of us to do yeah, most yeah, things. Yeah, I was going to say, right? yeah, you're not unique in this. But now, now I feel like, um, you know, my day is much more likely to be... They're, they're 900 miles in my backyard of trails. Mm -hmm. you know, there's eight, wow. 800 square miles of, of wilderness and 900 miles of trail. Wow. And I'm much more likely now to just get up and, and find one that I haven't hiked and start hiking it. And 18 miles later, mm -hmm. I might have something to write about for that yeah, day. Right. I mean, the problem working that way is you're six miles in when you have this brilliant, you know, you just <laughs> yeah, have to get exactly. that piece yeah. of paper. And Where's my damn typewriter? Exactly, yes. really quickly. Yeah, <laughs> and, and somehow pecking it in on a, on a, on a phone isn't quite uh, you know, <laughs> right. conducive. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the, it's, it's, there's a great, you mentioned uh, that uh, cantankerous journalist uh, Thoreau, oh, I can't Mr. remember Thoreau, what word you yeah. use, but uh, right. you know, he, 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 his line is, um, uh, breathe the air, drink the drink, eat the fruits, mm -hmm. live in each season as it passes, right. resign yourself to the influence of the earth. Right. And that's what I've been trying to do. Right, right. Yeah. Right, wow. Um, one thing that's, that's kind of amazing, uh, too, is the detail, both the, the nature detail, but also you tell stories that go back to uh, so a hundred years or so, right? And you've more, got you right. I mean, there okay, are maybe ancient late myths throughout this story. Right, right. I mean, Ovid plays a central role right. in the book, yeah. and other indigenous uh, myths. Are, right. Are, you talk about, I think, how trees were the first religion for the yeah. Celts and yeah. the Druids, and for lots of other people. But in any case, I, I wonder how much. Um, it must have been tons of research for this, just to get historical detail for the because again, the characters. We, we're often introduced to characters by like their great grandparents, right? Yeah. And you've got details of what it would have been like in the Midwest in the late 19th century. And um, I mean, you, you must have, I, I can tell it took five years to do <laughs> this. I mean, well, but. and as you say, you know, if you, really, if you really take seriously this descriptive act as part of the narrative act, if you right. really want to say. Which there seems to be a lot of, yeah, you, you're definitely taking it seriously. Yeah. There's no. Uh, right. It's not. It's not something that's percolating in the background of a human, you know, of a of a primarily psychological or sociological story. I mean, they right. they actually become, you know, essential protagonists in their own right. And to do that, you know, if if part of the arrival point of the book is, we have to learn to see these invisible things that mm -hmm. are so right. much older than us, so much bigger than us, and so you know, so much more ingenious. Uh, uh, than we realized they were. Right. Then you actually have to ha have to get them in their specifics. And this right. question of, you know, what is that tree in front of me becomes, you know, it, the, the, it, it, everything has to do with the precise nature of the details. And mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. only the individual trees, but, but types of forests. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that, you know, it's not, it's not incidental to the story, it is the story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and to be able to, to, to move through the, the, those regions of, of this country and to see them as having personalities and, right. and distinctive qualities, you know, that, that's part of the animism that I'm trying to get to here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, the individual people you describe and the cultures they come out of because we have people who are Indian and we have people right. who are... Uh, sort of Scandinavian Midwestern, you know, there's human cultures, but each, as you say, each of the species or each of these forests has its own culture yeah. or its own yeah. personality, I mean, as you say, as well. Yeah. So. And that's, that's, the, that's the goal, to see, to see these things not as resources or as aesthetic mm -hmm. accoutrements, but right. actually those creatures that are, that are making it possible for us to live here and that have right. made us who right. we are, right. both biologically and culturally. Right, right, right. Um, right. So, you know, the, the, in the Smokies, for instance, there are six different kinds of forest wow. that have distinct qualities to them. And, and, you know, what that forest is doing right. has everything to do with its altitude, its aspect, and so forth. But the, the, right. the, the character of the forest, the personality of the forest, mm -hmm. changes the way that human being in that forest can be and what you know who we are when we're there you know so so the flip side i started talking a little bit about patricia westford's work and she, she of course is drawn from real world scientists um 
in, including a, a couple of very prominent women researchers, hmm. um, the, 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 the extension of the story, it's even crazier than this idea of, of trees uh, having over-the-air communication, sharing a kind of immune system. And this has to do with work that's pioneered by um, many people. Suzanne Simard is a, is a name uh, in the forefront of this field, but it has to do with underground um, connection between trees. And this is becoming more broadly known to the general public, but um, fungus, uh, you know, the, the, the long filaments, you know, it can be, it can be you know, they, the, the underground uh, fungal threads, they, they go directly into the roots of a tree, sometimes even into the cells of the, of the roots. And they set up this mutualism, this kind of two-way street. So they can't photosynthesize for themselves. The trees are creating, you know, hydrocarbons and sugars that they're feeding the fungus with. The fungus, which is expert at extracting nutrients, secondary metabolites from the soil, is giving them back to the trees. But get this, they're, you know, they're, they're wired up together throughout a forest, and not just inside one species, but between different species. And these trees are feeding each other and, and giving each other medicines. And, you know, sometimes the, these large trees, what, what Simard calls the, um, the mother trees, will keep an understory tree alive for 75 or 80 years, and the tree you know, ne never goes anywhere. It just mm. stays there while it's, being, while it's being nurtured by this, you know, um, uh, socialist economy. I'm sorry to say that word, but... <laughs> <laughs> right, this, You're in California, this, okay. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> right. This is Santa Monica, after This <laughs> underground economy, literally, right? And, the, and, the, and the, the fungus is acting like this banker, you know, figuring out how the health of the forest can be preserved through this massive act of cooperation. And so that's, that's in the, the heart and soul of the book, too, that somehow in our right. intensely individualist commodity right. culture, it, we, we've, we've set this up, we've, we've, we've adopted this notion that meaning is an altogether private thing. It's mm -hmm, only mm -hmm. something that you manufacture for yourself. Right. Right. And, and our, it's our, purely personal yeah. and individualistic. Predicated and, uh, on the idea the that. The bonds between us are, are not important. Mm -hmm. and well, and, and our obligations or interdependence with things that aren't us aren't, aren't at all. Important. Right. Or even and less important. All yeah. of this is predicated on a kind of huge, gross misreading of, of evolution. Right, right, as driven almost exclusively by competition. Right. Well, it's interesting to have Stanford and Silicon Valley and you know this sort of libertarian hotbed on the other side of, of the bay, yeah. effectively from yeah. the uh, from the forest where all these things are so tightly yeah. uh, tightly bound and, and interdependent. Yeah. So it's as you say, it's sort of two different ways of looking at life That's itself right. or something. That's right. And, and the book is, a, is, a, is an attempt to articulate through narrative and through story. I mean, it, it is event-driven, it is character-driven. Yeah. But it's driving toward this notion that we need to think about uh, what is actually happening in the world beyond our world in a different way. That for every act of, of uh, competition, there are many, many acts of cooperation and reciprocity, and we need, right. we need a new way of thinking about that, right. because it, it, could, it could have a profound difference in the kind of society that we create right. from here on. Right, right. I want to open up to the audience in a second. I, my last question, something we haven't talked about a lot, just pick one or two that you're interested in. I just wonder which writers, uh, whether of the distant past or your contemporaries or whatever, uh, novelists, poets, whatever, uh, you feel are feeding into this book or whatever you're, you're thinking about these days. Okay, uh, that's good. I hadn't, hadn't actually prepared for the question. <laughs> um, but there, I made one great nonfiction discovery. I mean, it's stupid to call it discovery because this guy in his day was like, the widest read naturalist huh. in America, or one of them. His name is Donald Colross Peaty. Has anybody ever? Huh. I mean, I think he's almost unknown now. But he, he, wrote, he wrote two great books on trees um, in the, I, I want to say, 50s, yeah, early 50s. Yeah. And they've been combined and abridged a little bit uh, and brought out as a single volume called um, a Natural History of North American Trees. What I love about it is he's, he's writing as a naturalist, he's really writing as a scientist with, with the information that's, that was current up to his moment. But 
but he writes like a poet. In a, and, and this idea that we have now where, where science writing has to be somewhat um, dispassionate or, mm. or impersonal, mm. you, know, you just didn't have it. And there are these mm-hmm. marvelous mm-hmm. passages, and he, you know, I, I, I wish I, I could quote from them at length, but you know, page after page it says these um, deeply, deeply resonant, uh, you know, the, the, he'll, he'll do each, each tree species in turn, and mm-hmm. he'll make it, uh, it's stupid to say he'll make it come alive because they were alive <laughs> before he was right. doing his thing. Um, as for fiction writing, I, 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 w- one of the things that was just so thrilling for me when, when Barbara Kingsolver wrote her mm-hmm. review in the Times is I, I felt like I'd come across, you know, I, I felt in her a kind of kindred spirit, someone who mm. she trained as a biologist. That's right. And, yeah, and, right. And, and her writing has always been in f- deeply informed with all of the superstructure of living things that keep right. us keep us going. So for her to see that in this book was especially gratifying for me. Right. Yeah. Right. Great. Well, um, let's. Uh, ah, let's I get love some this. Before you even ask, yeah. there's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's, the, that's a the good crowd Q&A. is raring to go. Um, yeah, I can barely see, but let me. Uh, Ted, well, are you going to pass yeah, some microphone? If you have a question, I'm happy to bring shop. the microphone to you. Yeah. Just so a this quick reminder, right questions here, around right? here generally yeah, start with yeah. a W or an H and sometimes a D. They are typically short. Only Scott Timber gets to ask follow-up questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Launched on warning. <laughs> uh, you talk about uh, sort of the intelligence of plants. You know, Darwin wrote about this kind of he thing did. extensively. Mm. He wrote yep. a book called The Power of Motion in yep. Plants. And to mm. give you two examples, he talks about, look at a, look at a tree that's thick with stems and branches. They don't run into each other. Yeah. They know how to avoid each other. And then also down in the roots, the radicals are those little filaments that negotiate the pebbles and the soil and find their way to nutrients and water. Yeah. They find their way. He considered the intelligence of a root in a radical yeah. to be equivalent probably to a worm. Absolutely right. And mm, yeah. uh, so he analyzed how cleverly uh, these well, that's, there's more to be said. I was with you as you read that first page and a half. I, tr- I hiked the Troncos Creek Trail above Palo Alto oh. two or three times a week for F- years. Fantastic. Through all the seasons. It's right. just luscious and fantastic. wonderful. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And that, and that notion that if, if there were a brain in the tree, it would be in the, in the tip of the root. But mm. in fact, I think now there's almost the sense that if there are brains if there is intelligence in plants, it's also aggregate. It's it's not right. limited to the individual. It's this it's this distributed network that's um, that's producing these complicated sets of signals back and forth among individuals. But it, this notion of of um, the behavior of trees being a supple response to a changing environment, and you and you and you pointed out his observation about you know. The, the way in which the arborescence of a tree is controlled. If you're interested, you know, go home tonight or later, you know, uh, uh, tomorrow, and do a Google image search for something called crown shyness. Hmm. It, it has to do with trees that simply stop growing when their branches are about to touch other branches. Hmm. And, and you'll see a, amazing images of this phenomenon that, mm. that will give you pause about what, what exactly that force that drives the Trees with really good manners, That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more, more proof that humankind can <laughs> right. learn something right. From, uh, right. from them. Uh, anybody else? Uh, got the mic, <coughs> got the mic, excuse me, right here. Uh, I'm gonna switch subjects. I wonder what the path was from something like Plowing the Dark, which for the, really set the stage and inspired Phil Rosendahl to make Second Life or an alternate reality and virtual reality, which is, I would say, the opposite or, or the na- you know, very different than the forest you're describing. So could you talk something about those two visions and how right. you connect them? Thank you, and you give me an opportunity to, to mention one other character in the book. Um, <laughs> Who, whose name is Nile Mehta, who, right. who, who grows up as the son of an immigrant, uh, 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 you know, uh, 
a South Asian uh, immigrant who ends up working for Intel, basically, in, in Silicon Valley, and follows his own career through a kind of uh, second life gaming world. Uh, he's, he's crippled and confined to a, to a wheelchair. Um, and he, he uh, is a kind of personification of this migration um, that, that we humans are enacting into symbol space, into, into digital spaces. Um, for, for better uh, or, or for worse. And yet he also has a, a kind of conversion moment where he realizes that these, these massive multiplayer games that he's devoted his life to have what he calls a Midas problem. They're just kind of recreating the, um, the, the, the runaway success of commodity capitalism in miniature. You know? um, and, and he turns toward the end of the book toward a project um, that repurposes that, that the di digital program. And his dream is that somehow these, these prosthetic extensions of ours, our descendants, if you will, might be the key toward, th th they might somehow teach us to understand or interpret those creatures uh, from whom we've parted ways you know, in a, in a uh, most recent common ancestor a long time ago. It, it's been a frame that, that puzzles the diehard uh, naturalist readers, you know, th those, those, those who are looking only for an affirmation of the green world. I, I stand by the frame in, in a number of ways. I mean, it's interesting to, 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 to point out that the environmental movement and ecological thinking actually don't emerge in human history until we have large-scale computation. Hmm. Because we can't solve problems on the scale and complexity of natural interactions without that massive prosthetic extension of our ability to simulate, to model. Uh, so the, all those themes of plowing the dark, the notion of uh, setting up a virtual recreation of, a, of, a, of an external or natural world, come back in this book, in that frame of the book. Um, and the, 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 it's, it's, it's a strange, you know, it, there, there are people who feel that the only way forward is backwards, right? That we have to somehow completely stop the direction of, of culture and, and technology and, and abandon them and go back into a, a, a kind of pre-technological relationship to other living things. I don't see that happening. I, 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 I also, but, I, but I, I think that there is a way in which life selected for and produced consciousness that culture selects for and produces a, a, a growing awareness of what lies beyond culture, and that somehow, if we are to move forward, it's going to have to be through the best of what we've been able to, to, to create. And, and that means taking these incredibly powerful tools that, I mean, think of the ways that we, we use these almost you know, unthinkingly now, big data and, and uh, artificial intelligence in our, in our search engines and, in, in our, and how quickly we can find out things about the living world. I, 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 did, uh, I did something at, at, uh, at Harvard uh, a couple of days ago, and they brought me out to the, to the Arboretum, the Arnold Arboretum. There are sensors on every tree, not every tree, but they're, you know, and they're, and they're doing their phenology now. They're, doing, they're, they're, they're gathering their data rapidly and effectively and in a way that can be used. To, 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 to set up a deeper understanding of these intensely complicated systems. So we're gonna have to do it with the best of ourselves. You know, all these tools have, have many affordances, but in addition to some of the less fortunate uh, affordances, like our increasing will willingness to commodify even ourselves and our, and our friends in social networking and so forth, we also have to, uh, to understand and, and leverage and, and emphasize the positive affordances of technology. Uh, 
sort of to, to jump off that answer, I, I haven't read the book, I promise I will regardless of what you say. Um, do, do you find hope given how dire the situation is and wh where do you get it from? Yeah, that, th this book really raises that question of hope versus despair. And one of the early reviewers said something like, um, I've never seen a book so unrelentingly pessimistic and yet so filled with hope. <laughs> so that's the little line that I'm walking. Um, I, I, like, um, I like Gramsci's formulation, you know, um, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. <laughs> but I, I, I also think it really, I think what you need to remember is hope for what? And I mean, the question is, if, if, if you ask me how hopeful I am for these, you know, three, three to four hundred million year old uh, creatures who have survived mass extinctions, I'd say that's a pretty good bet. If you're asking, you know, how, how, what, what's my hope that Los Angeles will look like it does a hundred years from now? That's a different question. So, so I suppose, I suppose, if I were to interpret your question in, in the way that's most interesting to me, it would be, do I have hope that we are going to be able to find ourselves, our way back into the world? I would say it's going to happen. The question is, will it happen uh, violently and catastrophically? Will it be forced on us in a way that you know does not brook any other answer, or or can we use this? astonishing capacity for, for foresight and, and, and modeling uh, to, 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 to make it happen without an almost unthinkable amount of death and destruction. <sighs> Depends on what day, you ask me, <laughs> I guess. I, I, I want to be hopeful. And, and, and there, there, the, the, the force of human culture is so immense that if we could learn to see, if we could learn to look, if we could learn to take the non-human world seriously, we can act very quickly. And, and for those of you who are looking for, for more specific hope to more um, cataclysmic, immediate problems, I, I've recently become aware of, of this project uh, Drawdown. Does anybody else? Just Google that word, Drawdown. You know, the, 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 the idea is that to, it's, it's going to be very difficult to change our, our, our carbon behaviors on the, on the consumption and, and production end. But it might not be as difficult as we think to solve or offset a lot of that problem by sequestering. And it's, it's fascinating, they, you know, these are scientists throughout the world, you know, an in international uh, uh, armada of scientists who are looking at the most possibly effective ways of, of, of dealing with climate change. And what's amazing to me is you look at these top 80 solutions for drawing down carbon, for sequestering carbon, and you'll be amazed at how many involve trees and forests, you know, and modifications to our agricultural system that involve intercropping and, and permaculture and, and other tree-related. Uh, so, what, hopeful or not, uh, you know, the necessary first step is to start taking these creatures seriously and to know what, what kind of asset we have, you know, in them. You know, when we stop thinking of them as a consumable resource and start thinking about them as a, as a symbiont on this planet. Time for a couple of questions. Yes. Um, having read a bunch of your books and, and really loving them, the one thing that always strikes me is um, in addition to being lyrical and, and smoothly delivered and, and beautiful, they seem like uh, back-breaking, mind-twisting amounts of research. And I know you were starting to talk about research before, but um, it's, it's such an experience to read the, the span of what you take on. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about research and um, 
where that mountain of research is for you. Is it, is it usually at the beginning and that teaches you interesting characters and gives you senses of shapes of story? Is it the whole time? Are you, is, is the fun of it for you going between research and, and writing things up? Uh, I'm just curious. Yeah, good question. It's a lovely question. Um, and, and the first is to say that it's never backbreaking because it's just so compulsive. I mean, that you, you used also the word fun. You know, I, I, I read well over 100 books for this one. Um, but, you know, it's just, it, it was a joy. It was, it was all I wanted to do. And in fact, I'm still reading about trees now. So, you know, it's a, sort of the first time in my career that, that one subject for a book hasn't passed into another. I just want to stay mm -hmm. here. You know, I just want to keep, keep writing about this. And, you know, because I was a, a beginner on the topic, I had to start with really rudimentary field guides and, and work my way outwards from there. But the literature is amazing. And not just about trees as biological things, but trees as, as cultural artifacts and historical. And, and you know, the, the histories of, of uh, people's relationship with trees. And because, because Redwood Summer and the, and the Timber Wars played such a big role in the book, many, many very specific political histories of, of trees, I, I just couldn't get enough of it. You know, it's... Um, I wonder if you found that, that almost every culture, I, I think one of your characters says this, that almost every uh, culture on the planet started its religion built around trees or forests. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I could, you know, how broadly you could make that generalization, right. but the, 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 the reading that I did just led, led me on and on into, into yeah. uh, you know, tree, the, the centrality of trees yeah. to, the, to the foundational cultures of pretty much, you know, most areas of the earth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they would have been for ancient people, whether they were in China or South America or Ireland or wherever, trees, as they are in this book, they would have been the biggest, most amazing, most intricate yeah. and complex thing that yeah. that ancient man or prehistoric man had seen, right? So it's a very yeah. natural thing that they say, if there's a, cent a bunch of gods, they're somehow in these things yeah. or connected through these things. Very good observation. Right. I mean, the, the number of times, and that's why Ovid is so important to right. people right. turning right. into trees. You know, that, right. that, that kinship um, that seems somehow weirdly apparent to us when we look at, look at these creatures. Um, but the other fun thing about the research on this one, in addition to, to the print, was traveling around, talking to people, talking to people whose job it is to, um, to take care of or nurture or, 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 or work with trees, but also just every, everybody. You know, I would tell people, yeah, I'm writing a novel about trees, and after that initial moment of a slight <laughs> embarrassment, uh, yeah. <laughs> really, a novel <laughs> about trees? They, they, you know, they always had a story, or many stories. You know, once, once you unleash a, a person's private sense of what, what those, uh, uh, you know, what, what trees mean to them, you know, the, the note-taking was never-ending. Yeah. And our final question for the evening. Uh, good evening. I want to thank you so much for your conversation. And forgive me because I've never heard of you or read any of your books. Yes, I was called to, to this because of the, the, the emphasis on trees. Um, I often say to people, uh, they ask me for a business card, and I said, you know, I, I don't have those. I'm in a long-term relationship with some trees. <laughs> <laughs> and they get it. You know, they kind of get it. But I wanted to, I was up at the Redwoods also this year, and I wanted to know whether or not they spoke to you the way they spoke to me, and whether you were able to create a dialogue in the book that conveyed to humanity that they're not really saving the trees and they're not really, as you said, saving the planet. They're really saving themselves by their own interconnectedness yeah. that they're ignorant of because as the trees, the different species of the trees have different treasures for our pleasure, we as races of people on this planet have different pieces of the puzzle that's, exactly that's necessary it. for our evolution in harmony. That's exactly it. How do you expect me to add anything yeah, to that? Yeah, that's pretty much that's the so theme of the book. Put. Well said, yeah. yeah. But, give you something succinctly that you were able to convey in that book that yeah. would cause people, like when I say to someone, no, I'm in a long-term relationship with some right. trees, I don't, I don't do that, yeah. you know, I want that flow to continue. They get it immediately, 
if there is some, some you know, uh, methodology that was capable to strategically implant a seed, if you will, yes. uh, in the consciousness yes. of humanity yes. that will allow for us to finally get along with each other in a way that will save ourselves from ourselves. Yeah, precisely. Uh, they did give me something, and I hope that I have given it back through the book, and, and that will depend upon the stories that individual readers bring to the book. But, you know, and I don't know about your experience, but one of, one of the most profound for me, and especially under that, in, in those forests, under those trees, you know, I'm apprehending them with what I can learn, you know, through my intellect. I'm also just apprehending them visually, just smelling them and feeling them and, 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 and sensing them. But everything depends upon changing your time scale. You know, just, just standing still long enough to see not what you think is in front of you, what you'd like to be in front of you, or what you wish were in front of you, but what it actually is in front of you. So, so more than anything, I think when, when the tree spoke to me, and you know, the, the, I, I learned it in the redwoods, and I went back out east to the trees that I, I thought I knew from my child, but childhood, but now I had to see again for the first time. It all had to do with that stillness. It all had to do with simply looking, not expecting, but, but looking until you had an answer to that question. What is that tree in front of me doing that no other tree is doing? Right? And it's that particularization, I think, um, that, that put me into a different relationship with, with trees. Um, and that, and that our hope comes out in the story. Hmm. All right, well, thanks very much. No, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.